Now to a CNN exclusive. We're getting our first look at the letter former President Obama left for President Trump. That's the Oval Office in January. Former President Obama leaving several pieces of advice for his successor. Has President Trump listened? First listen to what President Trump said about receiving that letter. Oval Office and found this beautiful letter from President Obama. We will cherish that. We will keep that. And we won't even tell the press what's in that letter. All right, let's discuss all this with CNN political commentators Jack Kingston and Bakari Sellers. Good morning to you, gentlemen. Uh, Bakari, let's start with you. And this letter hits on three different pieces of advice, which we'll drill down on in a moment. But it starts with congratulations. It ends by saying, know that we stand ready to help in any ways which we can. Now, let's turn back the clock a little bit to... Donald Trump's fuel, his rise in politics built on questioning uh, Barack Obama's birthplace, his campaign based on wiping away his legacy. How difficult do you think this letter was to write, Carr? I don't think it was difficult at all for the president, the 44th president of the United States. What we saw during the transition process was a man who uh, held the, the office in great esteem, in high esteem. And no matter who the president-elect was at the time, whether or not it was Hillary Clinton or, or Donald Trump, uh, he wanted to make sure that he was doing his job uh, as an outgoing president. And what we see is something that many of us miss. When you read the letter, you see someone who was very thoughtful, someone who was very deliberate, someone who set aside partisan politics and just upheld the fundamental tenets of our democracy in the office of the presidency. Um, and so I, I was very pleased. I, I will say this, that Barack Obama is a better man than I. Um, somebody who attacks your, your heritage that way and, and, and questions your, your, your birth. Uh, you then sit down and you shake his hand and you say you want to make sure that he can be the best possible president. So uh, my hat's off to the 44th president. And to the transition of power. Uh, Jack, let's touch on these pieces of advice. First, talked about how they both had been blessed. It's up to us to do everything we can to build more ladders of success for every child and family that's willing to work hard. Second, touches on American leadership in this world and how it is indispensable, perhaps noting at the isolationist talk, uh, of the campaign. And thirdly, Jack, we are just temporary occupants of the office, uh, warns the president to guard the traditions of rule of law, separation of powers, equal protection, and civil liberties. Which, if any of these pieces of advice, has President Trump followed in office? Well, actually, I'm glad that he's not listening to Barack Obama interpretation of rule of law, because all I can think about is Lois Lerner and the IRS Scandal. I think about them uh, calling James Rosen, the Fox reporter, a flight risk and serving him illegally. I think about um, Hillary Clinton's pay for place uh, shenanigans at the uh, State Department under Barack Obama. And I think of Fast and Furious. So if that's the uh, rule of law under Barack Obama, I'm glad that President Trump is not listening to it. Just firing the acting FBI director for not killing the Russia investigation fall under protecting the rule of law, Jack? Well, number one, the president can fire anybody at any time, as you know. And number two, we don't know why he fired um, uh, Comey based on that speculation. We do know based on the uh, Rosenstein letter why he fired him because of his incompetence. And apparently now we know that he was lying under oath when he said he did not write the uh, conclusion that Hillary Clinton was innocent before the investigation. We now have evidence that shows that he did not. Have, uh, so something like 17 eyewitnesses had not been interviewed when he started drafting the letter saying that she was innocent. So uh, We do know uh, this, Bakari. We know that there was a letter that was not published from the president and Stephen Miller citing that they were firing James Comey because he would not publicly clear the president and say he was not under investigation. When I mentioned those three pieces of advice, rule of law is one, separation of powers is another, and John McCain took to the Washington Post to warn the president, to tell him directly, that senators do not work for him. Do you think he's following the advice laid out in this letter? Well, I think you, you regardless of what, what Jack Kingston says or, or, you know, the talking points that many times we hear on, on Fox News, you know, the president was eight years scandal-free. He, scandal he and his entire, fast and he and his entire, he oh, and his entire family. And so what, what we're seeing now is we go to the heart of this letter. It just laid out some very, some very practical he laid out some very practical guidelines that would guide not just a Republican president, but a Democratic president as well, and everybody in between. The answer to your question is, I'm not sure that Donald Trump has read the letter, and if he has read the letter, it's apparent he hasn't taken that to heart. Well, We've had eight months, eight months, where this White House has been consumed with scandal, 
and palace intrigue. And what we this is exactly what we did not have. Well, we had a, Jack, uh, hang on a sec. I, I, I do have to say that CNN reporting suggests he shows this to several visitors to the Oval Office. It's very proud and cherishes this letter. I want to ask you about the first piece of advice, though. He says, it's up to us to do everything we can to build more ladders of success for every child and family that's willing to work hard. It's been reported also by Politico that if President Trump kills the Dreamers program, that that will be the one thing that gets President Obama to speak out against Trump on Facebook and perhaps on Twitter. Was he talking in that first bit of advice about the Dreamers Act? I, I don't know, because when we talk about rule of law and separation of power, certainly that would mean that executive orders should not be necessary, that you should let the legislative branch come up with major changes in the law of immigration. As you know, there are nine attorneys general right now who are suing the Department of Justice because of the illegal Dreamers Act, the DACA uh, deferrals that President Obama did. So if we're talking about um, rule of law, that's, you know, you got to let the legislative branch do that, do the lawmaking. Long way to go before they solve that Dreamers situation for those 800,000 here in the country. Jack Kingston, Bakari Sellers, thank you both. Thanks, Dave. Well, Dave. Um, We're about out of time, unbelievably. But before we go, you know, I, I, I've read this terrific book. I need to get you to called? sign my copy. Wait, you mean Amanda wakes up? <laughs> but, but you haven't signed my copy. I've read it. I've done my homework. I've searched for my story but, in there. Oh, you may recognize a few characters. If anybody needs bit. some Labor Day <laughs> distraction today from all of the crazy news, feel free to read or pick up Amanda wakes up about sign a gun. It. I'll sign right now. Great to work with you. It only took Great five to years. Be back. CNN Newsroom with Poppy Harlow picks up after this very quick break. Have a great Labor Day. It's Type Fast with Tom's Chewy Bites. Fast relief in every bite. Crunchy outside. Chewy inside. Tom's Chewy Bites. Monday morning, everyone. I'm Poppy Harlow. John Berman has this morning off. We begin this hour with an emergency response to a global threat. This morning, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency tells CNN that North Korea's latest and biggest underground nuclear test represents, quote, a new dimension of threat with the whole world at risk. Now, one hour from now, the U.N. Security Council will meet for the second time in a week in an emergency session, while South Korea warns that yet another North Korean missile test appears to be in the works. For its part, South Korea has carried out live missile drills and plans more, signed off on the full deployment of U.S. defensive missile launch pads. Now, President Trump is not ruling out a preventative strike. That has set off a new round of threats from North Korea's state media agency. Here is just an excerpt. Every time the U.S. goes crazy talking about sanctions and war, our will of vengeance will become a 100,000 times stronger. Provoke us as you wish. With our nuclear strategic weapons, we will eradicate the land of the U.S. No trace left on Earth. We're following all the developments morning all around the world. Let's begin with our Will Ripley, who joins us from Tokyo. Then we'll get to Barbara Starr at the Pentagon. And Will, let me just begin with you, because you have been to North Korea 14 times. You returned from your latest visit this weekend. What is your take on this rhetoric and the recent escalation following uh, what they say is a hydrogen bomb test? Well, that statement that you just read, Poppy, also include yet another threat at the U.S. territory of Guam. And this is South Korean intelligence uh, says that they are observing activity in North Korea that leads them to indicate North Korea will fire some kind of ballistic missile, possibly before Saturday, which is a major national holiday. It's their foundation day in North Korea. South Korea says it could be a submarine launch ballistic missile, an intermediate range ballistic missile like the kind that they launched over Japan uh, last week. Or it could be an ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile like the kind that they tested twice in July. And uh, South Korea also believes this missile could be fired toward the Pacific Ocean. That would include potentially the U.S. territory of Guam. It's a lot to digest after some very fast moving developments on the peninsula. They tested the, this nuclear device, a hydrogen bomb, they say, over the weekend, the largest nuclear test ever in North Korea, creating a 6.3 magnitude earthquake. And then you have this apparent strife between President Trump and South Korea criticizing that country for appeasement of the North Korean regime. President Trump uh, also threatening China. And then you have Japan and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who's been on the phone 
constantly with the president. They have had two calls just in the last 24 hours. They obviously have a close relationship. Uh, president Trump appreciates Shinzo Abe's flattery, the fact that Japan will never openly criticize the president. And in fact, that we spoke uh, on New Day with the Japanese ambassador, Kordo Beso, who spoke about the tight-knit relationship between the U.S. Japan in the midst of this uh, escalating crisis. Japan itself has not talked about military options. We've talked about uh, going through the uh, international community, that is the Security Council. But we do appreciate the fact that uh, the U.S. administration, President Trump, has talked about every option being on the table. Our alliance between Japan and the United States is very important for Japan, and we really appreciate the fact that the United States is um, right behind us. Copy that uh, emergency United Nations Security Council meeting set to get underway within the hour. It is indeed, and we may hear from Nikki Haley as she goes into the meeting, so we'll be watching for that and carry all of that live here. Um, you have another uh, statement from the president this morning, and let me just read it for you. He says the United States is considering, in addition to other options, stopping all trade with any country doing business with North Korea. Now, he may well uh, will just have written China there, right, because that, that is who this is clearly directed at because China is responsible for 90 percent of the trade that North Korea does. Um, what do you make of that? Treasury Secretary Mnuchin uh, said he's preparing these sanctions right now. And, and I've been speaking with some, some analysts, Poppy, who think that this really undermines the United States' credibility when talking with China about the North Korean issue because there are hundreds of billions of dollars in a trade uh, between the two countries every single year when you factor in goods and services. The, the, the relationship is enormous. And to, it, first of all, it's essentially impossible to just all out stop trading with China. This is such an intricate economic relationship, not to mention the fact that the economic consequences, yes, they would be disastrous for China. They'd also be disastrous for the United States and for U.S. consumers. Uh, and so you have China responding, saying that this kind of rhetoric is unacceptable, that threatening China on trade is not fair, that North Korea is a totally separate issue from the economic issue. And yet President Trump has brought those two together. There could be some very difficult conversations to come between them. And frankly, it's really important to note that China and the U.S. have very different goals when it comes to the ultimate outcome of North Korea and what they want from North Korea. The U.S. is not on the same page as China is in many respects on that. Will Ripley in Tokyo, thank you very much for the reporting. Let's go now to the Pentagon. Barbara Starr is there. And you have South Korea uh, talking about and carrying out these additional drills and saying that their intelligence is showing them that North Korea is preparing for another ICBM test. What are you hearing in terms of preparations from the United States, given those words from Defense Secretary Mattis yesterday? Well, you know, the Defense Secretary said, said that the U.S. would be prepared if there was an attack. He said the U.S. would be prepared if there was a threat. Uh, what the threshold may be for some U.S. military action probably remains deliberately publicly unclear. They want him to believe that they would respond with that overwhelming massive force if he was to threaten or attack, uh, you know, all everything's in place that would ever be needed uh, to carry out uh, most of these options. The discussion, I think, right now is whether or not you want to send additional military assets to the in some kind of so-called show of force. Does it make a difference if you send an aircraft carrier? The U.S. has done that before. The North Koreans are very well aware that manned U.S. aircraft not very likely to fly into in airspace? Do you want to send more missile defense? Do you want to send more bombers to Guam that could both protect Guam and fly over the South Korean peninsula? So we're not hearing anything specific yet, but it does seem to be the same general range of options are on the table, plus the message from Secretary Mattis to Kim Jong-un that if he threatens, if he attacks, the U.S. would have the capability for a massive response. Poppy? Made that very clear uh, with those remarks yesterday. Barbara Starr at the Pentagon, thank you so much. Joining us now to discuss CNN military analyst, Major General James Spider Marks and Laura Rosenberger, director at the Alliance for Securing Democracy. She's also a former National Security Council director for China and South Korea under President Obama. She served as a foreign policy advisor for Hillary Clinton's campaign. It's nice to have you both here. And General Marks, let, let me begin with you. The supposed H-bomb test that was carried out, that's what North Korea says it was, According to the New York Times, the, the power of that is so great, that would surpass the power of the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, given that and given this response from the president, how do you think it changes the calculation? Listen to this. Mr. 
Will you attack North Korea? We will see. What changes now? Well, Poppy, I think the fact that this was a hydrogen bomb, at least the <clears throat> scientific evaluation is that it was, um, is a distinction without a difference. <clears throat> North Korea is a nuclear power. This is another step in the direction of a more fulsome capability that they're going to have. I think the key thing in our mind that we need to really keep first and foremost is the military preparedness on the peninsula is at the highest level it's ever been. It always has been a fight tonight type of an environment. But we have to change we have to change the dynamic a little bit. If we're serious about the possibility of a military strike in North Korea, first of all, it would be in response to a provocation by the North. The United States and South Korea would not unilaterally, provocatively go after the capabilities in the North. We have an ability to test, we have an ability to monitor all the missile launches that have taken place before. We've been able to get the attitude and the flight pattern of that missile to determine it's not provocative either to Japan or to our neighbors in the South or the region. If it was, the United States, number one, would take it down, and number two, then that would open the door for a military response. But I think we have to keep that on the table. We also have to be very, very clear that, look, the United States and South Korea are not looking at the unification of the peninsula. That's off the table. We're not looking for a one Korea solution. And the denuclearization of the peninsula, I think, is aspirational, but it's a pipe dream. It's not have, going to occur. But, General, you have the president uh, <clears throat> just weeks ago threatening North Korea with fire and fury should it threaten the United States once again. Well, now it has clearly threatened the United States once again. The words this morning, it will eradicate the land of the U.S. with no trace left on Earth. True. Did the president box himself in? No, I don't think he did. And, and look, my point is... Um, this type of rhetoric is certainly not helpful, but it's not relevant. What is relevant in terms of the Korean Peninsula and clearly the, you know, the target being the communications target being Pyongyang and the regime is what we do, not what we say. What the president says, I think, is not particularly helpful. What is helpful is the fact the United States and South Korea remain prepared and words, vitriolic communications really adds nothing to this. We get whipped up about that stuff. But but we shouldn't. But, Laura, uh, when it comes to South Korea and having the United States on the same page as this key ally right now in the region, especially, you've got in the last 48 hours the president uh, criticizing South Korea, talking about their quote-unquote appeasement policy that he says will not work. And then you've got leaks coming out, Washington Post reporting, that the president is strongly considering pulling the United States completely out of this U.S.-South Korea trade agreement, which would infuriate South Korea. Effective strategy here? Yeah, Poppy, I have to say I'm extraordinarily concerned with what appears to be a lack of strategy from this administration, and in particular, a failure to coordinate with um, one of our really key allies in the region, South Korea. Will mentioned earlier the number of times that President Trump has spoken with um, Japanese Prime Minister Abe. Um, he has not spoken with the South Korean President Moon Jae-in since the nuclear test over the weekend. Um, instead, as you noted, he has um, tried to humiliate them on Twitter. These leaks about the, the free trade agreement um, and his, you know, considering pulling out of that. The problem is that one of Pyongyang's goals is to divide the U.S. from our allies, divide us from South Korea, to divide us from Japan. And what President Trump is doing and saying is playing right into Pyongyang's hands. So the other, so, oh, go ahead. I was just, just going to say on that point, because we just had this cross, some more information that is helpful context for what you're saying, that, uh, you know, you've had in the last 24 hours President Trump speaking with Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of Japan twice, and then it took him, you know, there's 30 hours before he called uh, President Moon of South Korea, and, and senior officials in the White House are telling us that the president has grown frustrated increasingly at Moon's stance, which he called appeasement, uh, at, at North Korea, not believing he, that, 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 that President Moon is doing enough. Um, given all of that, isn't it also important to note that China has very different goals here, big picture, Laura, uh, for North Korea and the future of the peninsula than the United States does? Absolutely, Poppy. You hit the nail on the head here. It's really important. We hear a lot of talk about how China needs to do more. China has the leverage. And those are both true. There's no question that we need to see China taking further action to curtail trade, to cut off the flows of money, to cut off the flows of supplies that are fueling and, and providing input for the nuclear and missile programs. 
Um, but we also need to understand that China is never going to have the same interests as we do. And that's why it concerns me when we see very um, vague statements from the president about whether it's cutting off trade uh, with, as you indicated, would, would really be implying China here, um, or whether it's about um, China needs to solve this for us. China is never going to solve this for us. And it's really dangerous if, if we begin to, to think in that way. I do also want to say I, I agree with Major General Marks on many things. Unfortunately, I, I do disagree with him that the president's words here don't matter. Our adversaries and our allies alike look to the president's words as a key signal of both deterrence and reassurance. And the credibility of our words matter incredibly in these kinds of scenarios. And one of my biggest concerns with what we're seeing playing out right now is the risk of miscalculation. Miscalculation by one of our allies that thinks that the credibility of our commitments, our defense commitments, aren't real. Um, or miscalculation by Pyongyang, who misreads a signal that President Trump inadvertently sends. I think these words matter extraordinarily, and I think it's really concerning that they seem to be uncoordinated from any sense of strategy. Major General, I have 30 seconds. Do you want to respond to that? Well, I think Laura is absolutely correct that words, words matter, but in this particular case, actions are incredibly important. If we, in fact, continue to hold, and we do, the military option as being part of the solution, we understand that there is nothing but a bad outcome that would result from that. Clearly, Kim would disappear if that were the case. His regime would go away. China has a different opinion about that, about what North Korea needs to look like after some type of a conflict would occur. But diplomacy must be the way we move forward. So I agree with Laura that in order to have a diplomatic solution, we have to have a strategy that's pretty well articulated. So the words that the president uses in terms of the message it gets to Pyong, Pyongyang is much different than the message that gets to our allies. I agree that that concerns me. We have to be able to have a very tight, cohesive alliance. Frankly, it's never been stronger in terms of our regional focus in that part of the world. This General is Mark as strong as it's ever been. General Marks, thank you. Laura Rosenberger, thank you both very much. Ahead for us, a global threat reaction coming fast and furious uh, around the world to North Korea's hydrogen bomb test. We are on all of these fast-moving developments. And the president Set to scrap protections we are hearing for so-called dreamers or ending the DACA program. This is amid growing backlash from his own party. What does this mean for the hundreds of thousands of dreamers currently in this country? We'll speak with one live right here and ahead. A massive cleanup after Harvey and a huge price tag. The average family's hectic home. It's witness 2 DIY duo, SC Cup, unfiltered. Weeknights at 7 on HLN. At any moment, President Trump is expected to speak with South Korean President Moon on the phone. We're waiting for that. And this call will come just minutes before the U.N. Security Council kicks off its second emergency meeting in less than a week after North Korea tested that hydrogen bomb. We've got live team coverage. Let's begin with Paula Hancock, who joins us from Seoul. Uh, look, it is no secret uh, that the president is frustrated with President Moon, thinks that South Korea has not done enough. The word he chose to use is appeasement. So now what, as these two leaders prepare to speak? Well, Poppy, it will be a very interesting phone conversation to be listening into, certainly. The tweet that uh, the U.S. president uh, put out uh, yesterday talking about appeasement, a, a very loaded word and, and, and quite a shock, really, to many South Koreans, uh, didn't go down particularly well. The Blue House felt that it had to uh, respond soon after that. So about midnight, there was a text message that went out to reporters saying that South Korea does agree that there should be pressure, there should be sanctions in order to try and get North Korea back to the negotiating table. And certainly we've seen from President Moon Jae-in over the past uh, week or so, we've seen some fairly significant live fire drills in response to what we've seen from North Korea. One happened just this Monday morning, fighter jets, surface to surface ballistic missiles, uh, a very visual uh, live fire drill showing that uh, that they had willingness to destroy North Korean assets and the leadership uh, as well. So certainly a, a very clear threat to the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, there. Uh, but we do know, as you say, that, that White House officials, senior White House officials, have told uh, CNN that, that Mr. Trump feels frustration at Moon's stance uh, towards North Korea, feeling that it's too soft. And certainly we saw that frustration play out in that tweet. Also, on top of that, you've got the fact that, uh, that the U.S. president wants to renegotiate the free trade deal, uh, which certainly many in South Korea thought was signed, sealed and delivered. They don't want to, but they will. Uh, it, it was, but the president certainly has the authority to pull out a big promise that he made to a lot of his base. We'll see what happens and what it all means for one of our key allies in the region.
Thank you very much, Paul Hancock in Seoul. Let's go now to Fred Fleikton, who joins us in Moscow. So you've got Russia, also a key player here, ramping up its military preparedness. What are they actually doing in the face of this increased North Korean aggression? Well, the Russians have said that they're very concerned about that nuke test uh, by the uh, North Koreans. They've also monitored the situation very closely. We have to keep in mind the Russians also have a common border with North Korea. But, Poppy, what the Russians are also doing is they're also criticizing the U.S. They accuse the U.S. of saber-rattling. They say, look, none of the rhetoric that's been coming from the Trump administration has been particularly helpful in all of this. And the one thing that the Russians are very critical of and very concerned about is obviously the U.S. moving assets into the Pacific theater. And the Russians have actually even talked about increasing their own missile troops uh, in response to the U.S. moving some assets in there. So it certainly is a situation where, on the one hand, the Russians are saying, look, we don't condone any of what North Korea is doing. We consider it a major threat, especially nuclearizing uh, the Korean peninsula. But on the other hand, they're also criticizing the U.S. as well. And then you have China, which is, of course, by far uh, North Korea's biggest trading partner, and really its lifeline in many ways. And they've said, look, on the one hand, we also condemn uh, this nuclear test. They say it's absolutely unacceptable. But they also criticize the Trump administration as well, especially that threat uh, that he put out, uh, that President Trump put out on Twitter, uh, cutting off or threatening to cut off any sort of trade ties with countries that do business with North Korea. Chinese saying that's unfair and unacceptable. They say, look, we're trying to help in this situation. Uh, don't threaten us. The U.S., of course, says that they believe that China could do a lot more than it actually is. And it's, it certainly could. Fred Plyton, thank you very much for reporting from Moscow. We appreciate it. Hundreds of thousands of dreamers waiting to see what the president will decide with DACA. Some word from sources at the White House on that. And this dreamer will join us next. And tonight on CNN, an unprecedented look into the Reagan presidency, including the time that he called the Soviet Union the evil empire for the first time. Watch this. Let us be aware that while they preach the supremacy of the state, they are the focus of evil in the modern world. The Reagan Show with CNN Film tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern. Right back. It's time for the biggest...